so um, I have a presentation called Testing Best Practices in Ruby. If I could get somebody to come stand over here like this, I would love to stand and present over here. Um, so uh, apologies to Joel, who has seen this once, Anthony, who has now seen it like 17 times. Um, so uh, I should have a warning slide as well. Uh, taking these may be dangerous. I have no idea. These are just my opinions. Blah, blah, blah. Um, <coughs> So some of these probably not controversial, others potentially controversial. Um, so the TLDR, which I'll start with if anybody wants to get out of here. Uh, be explicit, be concise, don't rely on coincidences, make everything testable. Um, and I will expand on all of these as I go. So <clears throat> a couple quick slides, why test? Um, so actually one of the, I think, underrated reasons to test is the design of your code. Uh, testing your APIs as you're developing them, things like that. So if it's hard to write a test, maybe you're in a case where you actually have an exceptionally complicated problem that you're trying to solve and you know, you're setting up a lot of data, it's an integration test, but 99% of the time if the test is hard to write, your code's probably wrong or it could be cleaner or it could be abstracted differently. Um, you know, there's the old saying, the solution to every problem is more abstraction except the problem of too much abstraction. Um, and I think that applies there. Um, so ensuring branching logic behaves appropriately, exercising boundary conditions, those are pretty bit bread and butter. Um, refactoring, so writing tests gives you a safety net when you go to refactor your code so that you know if you have a test there and it's passing and then you refactor your code and the test is now failing, you have two questions, was my test wrong or was my code or is my code wrong? Um, ideally, most of the time the answer is my code is wrong. Um, onboarding new team members, so it's really nice to be able to give somebody a huge test suite and say go nuts and if everything's green, you know, you're at least in the ballpark of this being okay. If, if 50 tests suddenly break as soon as you make a change, we're in trouble. Um, <coughs> and the documentation is never out of date, so, um, you know, if, you, if somebody wants to know how the code works, they can either read a document that may or may not have been updated in a year or they can run all your tests and go look through your test spec and if they want to know how a piece of code behaves. Um, so I test first, so you know, there's the principles of test-driven development, behavior-driven development. I don't think the testing first is the right approach to every situation, but some of the reasons. Um, <coughs> decreases coupling, so if you write the test first, you're less likely to leak any implementation details because you don't know what the implementation details are yet because you're writing the test first. Um, Get yourself into a rhythm, so you know the red, the red green refactor loop of write a test that fails, make it pass, then go back and shrink your code to be the simplest, smallest code that'll possibly make the test pass. Um, a lot of times, what I find myself doing is if I'm having trouble getting started on a problem, I'll start with some really stupid tests, like I'll test that the full name method appends the first and the last name and puts a space in the middle, and like you know something really stupid just to kind of get myself in a flow and then I'll kind of build my way up to the harder things as I go. Um, <clears throat> makes you ask the question, what do I really want to test? So you kind of shift into this tester mindset of how is this going to break? What sorts of data input is coming in? You know, what am I sending back? What are the different edge cases I'm dealing with? Um, and then it's easier to engage with third party when questions do arise. <clears throat> um, so actually Gregory Brown, who we were talking about earlier, um, I had stumbled a few days ago across um, he wrote a book called Ruby Best Practices that he culled from his blog, rubybestpractices.com. Um, and when he was writing Prawn, a PDF parser and generator, um, he had actually had a situation where he had a method that was like 20 lines long, and he said, there's got to be a simple way to do this. He had a set of about four or five specs that he posted to the Ruby mailing list, and somebody was able to shrink his 20 or 10 or 20 lines of code down into two lines of code. Um, that were clever without being obtuse, um, and they were able to check that all the specs were passing, and so it was a really, a really simple way to do that. <clears throat> so now the battery of Kyle's list of Ruby te testing best practices called from two years of reading, writing, refactoring, tests, running the gamut from awful to inspiring. Um, so, <clears throat> name test descriptively. This one's probably pretty obvious, but um, you see a lot of times you know, particularly people who are just learning testing, they'll write a test, you know, add friend. And what do I write here? There's like 5,000 different things I could test about adding a friend. 
and I have no idea which one I'm actually testing. So just by naming the test that, I'm now probably going to end up with a test that has like a bunch of different assertions that are all unrelated to one another, testing a bunch of different behaviors, and I've now gotten myself into, I've dug myself into a hole just by naming my test poorly. So give tests descriptive names like add friend raises an error when given a private user. Now even before I, even if I hadn't written any code, it's immediately obvious what I'm testing just from naming the method there. Uh, one assertion per test. So this is another one that sometimes I find myself breaking uh, and you know these aren't rules, these are suggestions or things to think about. Um, but you know in general basically here you know I'm testing the one I eat a sandwich, uh, you know, I am full and the sandwich has been eaten. But by testing both of these things simultaneously, it's possible that calling full on a human actually is what marks the sandwich as eaten, and maybe the eat sandwich method doesn't. So there's kind of this possibility that I've gotten cross-contamination or, you know, I may end up with some unexpected behavior. Is Whereas, that a rule that you feel is uh, good for unit testing only? Um, I would say it's especially good for unit testing. Um, I would say it's very rare that I break it on unit tests or that I, you know, act differently on unit tests. Um, but I would say in general, there's still mostly a focus to my tests. I think it's the exception rather than the rule that I have more than one assertion. Um, is that a satisfying answer or...? Do I need to like commit more? It's <laughs> cool. Okay. And it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say most of my tests are generally one assertion. So um, if you have use cases where you have multiple assertions and you want either validation or to prove that you're better than me, uh, feel free to like pull them up and show them to me. Uh, I was thinking of functional tests, like usually we will test the response code and response body in the same thing. Okay, I would I would say I probably do that as well most of the time. So, um, so yeah. So here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe the better the better test here is actually splitting it in two. So now you can validate that each piece of that this function is actually performing two actions independently, and you can verify those independently, um, and be sure that you have no side effects from one method to the other. <coughs> Declare your assumptions. Um, so this is one that almost every single code base has some of these in there. So in the bad test, I'm constructing a new person object and asserting that the popularity gets defaulted to 100. Um, but what's actually happening behind the scenes is that when I instantiate a new person, it's defaulting the things that they love to include Lady Gaga, um, which then by default gives them a popularity of 100. Um, so this is probably a particularly egregious case. I should have pulled a real example, um, and not just because it involves Lady Gaga as egregious. But, um, but you know, there's all these tests where people kind of just operate under the assumption that particular construction is happening in the constructor um, that probably needs to be explicitly defined as a separate test. So here, it's much more obvious from reading these two, the two tests on the bottom that there is a default and that the default is what results in the popularity being 100 rather than popularity always returning 100 or any of the, any of the other things that could possibly happen just given the first test. <coughs> so don't loop. Um, again, this one. Um, uh, I did not update this slide, so Chris Wingate was at the last presentation I gave, um, or he was supposed to be and did not show up, so ignore the Chris Wingate joke in there. Um, <coughs> so basically a lot of time, and this was actually based on a test that we had in my last company where there was a set of like 20 invalid passwords, and then one test which looped through the 20 invalid passwords and asserted that each one of them was invalid. Um, so if you have, you know, 20 different cases you're testing, there might be better ways to do this, but this is a particularly bad way to do that because if the first one fails and your other 19 are also invalid, you only get one piece of feedback and then you make the correction and then you only get one more piece of feedback and then you make the correction. And so you kind of end up in this really slow loop 
when you could get a lot more information and figure out that all of your password tests are failing simultaneously. So you would have been okay with it if it, for each failure it would have communicated that because you're conflicting with keeping things dry, right? If you just sort of paste that te code <coughs> test for each different password. Right. Um, so I would actually, sorry, I'm pulling this up real quick. So I would actually, um, personally, I guess I kind of would assert as somewhat of a principle that I actually am not, I don't care that much about keeping my tests dry. I'm actually more concerned with my tests being explicit than dry. So I would rather be able to look at a test and have it be relatively self-contained than definitely not repeat myself in any situation. So that's actually, I think, one of the, one of the things that, um, that bothers me a lot about a lot of our spec tutorials and things is that they they use the before con you know the before contexts like all over the place. So if I'm looking here at this test, I now have to like work through two or three different levels of before setup methods and teardown methods and things um, just to kind of understand the behavior of that one test. So I, I think, again, it kind of comes down to, so we discussed a different approach to this situation here, for example. Oh, actually, let me do, so the, the better one, I think, in this case is splitting it out into multiple tests and asserting all of the different possible ways in which they could fail. Um, because now it's obvious from looking at it what the documentation of that method is. Um, we did discuss one way that you can kind of split the difference here um, would be something like maybe creating a hash and saying, you know. That's not readable. Uh, no, it is fun. not. Thank you. Let me find a better color scheme. Thank you. Okay, slightly better. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Like something like this would probably even be a slightly better, um, you know, um, and then for each one of these, basically looping through. Um, I won't do all of this, but here doing test, you know, password, password fails because of failure reason, like. I think this kind of splits the difference between the two approaches. So you still get the good feedback, and you still have multiple tests that would all fail in the, in the failure case. Um, but it's a little bit drier than, than the other situation. And also pass a third string to assert with the method, or sorry, with a custom message. Right. Um, right. So I could do assert failure, or well, whatever. Whatever the method would be, yeah, and then I could pass. Um, sorry, assert true, you know, password not invalid. Um, is there a reason, I, I don't know that we talked about this last Saturday, that you have assert true rather than just using assert? Um, <coughs> we didn't talk about it. Um, so I use assert true, I guess, for Boolean methods. Like if I'm actually asserting, like if I don't want to just assert truthiness or falsiness, but I actually want to assert truth or false, like true or false. Um, so like if I if I have a Boolean method like invalid password in this case, like I don't want that to return me a password object. It feels like it kind of violates the contract of invalid password to me. I feel like it should return true or false if it's a question mark method. So assert true is some, it, it's just a wrapper around assert equal true that thing. So. Um, <coughs> to use factories to simplify, um, this is my Warcraft example. Um, <coughs> so basically here, um, we want to test that a peon gets set to gathering lumber when they get assigned to a tree. Um, <coughs> but let's say, for example, in order to create a peon, I have to instant, like it validates the presence of a position, a set of sounds, a skin, damage, armor, hilarity, and can't harvest. Um, so there's like seven things I have to fill in just to create a valid peon object, but only one of those actually matters to me, which is asserting that can harvest a tree. Um, so the better test there is to refactor that into a factory. So uh, uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with factories or not, but I'm guessing most people are. Um, so the concept of a factory is just um, create a way to basically instantiate a minimal valid object. Um, so a peon factory, for example, would automatically populate all of the things that are necessary to create a valid peon record. Um, and then here we would 
override the one that we actually care about, which is that they can harvest a tree. So it's possible that the peon factory might default to can harvest nothing or can harvest a mine or something like that. Um, so this test, it's easy to see exactly what you're testing, whereas this one, there's a lot of noise in the test. Um, so getting a little bit specific for a second, don't over define cucumber steps. This is my follow-up example. Um, <clears throat> given that I have a level 15 guardian of the weights and I have a rocket launcher, when I see a rad scorp, then I kill it in one shot. Um, this is actually adapted from a similarly bad test that was in a domain that's not as interesting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's, the second example is much better because now you have a set of reusable steps where given that I, I am a Fallout player, it's probably something that you can use in a lot of different places, whereas the first one is so hyper-specific. It's possible that you could do some matching on it, like, you know, have, you know, level 15, you know, have the 15 be parameterizable and Guardian of the Waste be parameterizable, but you still have to kind of define those steps or have them default to something. And, um, so if you use Cucumber, maybe I should have titled this like Kyle's Pet Peeves instead of Testing Best Practices. Um, <clears throat> So avoid setup and teardown methods. I kind of alluded to this one a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, in general, you know, I think there's this tendency to over dry tests and you end up with tests where, you know, as I said, particularly in the R spec world where you can have multiple nested contexts, you end up with this world where you have to parse out three or four different chains of, you know, construction calls and some of them override other ones that happened earlier and it becomes nearly impossible to determine what that test is doing without looking in several other places. Um, <clears throat> so in general, I would actually say I have some degree of repetition in my tests. Um, even if uh, even if I abstract out you know, three or four lines that are always common, in general, I won't abstract them out into a setup block. I'll abstract them out into a method that I actually explicitly call. So it's at least obvious that I should go look at that method to understand what's happening in this test rather than relying on um, sort of those chain mechanisms and things. So this one, uh, I think, is, you know, if you're kind of not having trouble with the way that chain setup blocks and teardowns and things work, feel free, more power to you. Um, but this is one that has been a pain for me. Um, there are some situations where I think it's perfectly acceptable. Um, so uh, we used Refinery CMS on a project, um, and Refinery CMS basically refuses to function unless you have one user object in your user table. So instead of having every test in your entire code base construct one user object before it goes and does something, um, those are cases where it makes a lot more sense to have a setup method, right? Because it's like, I don't care about that. It's not actually directly related to the tests that I'm running. It's just a thing that has to happen. So those are situations where I'm I definitely would not say every test in your entire application needs to instantiate a user object. Um, <clears throat> and then another place I use it is for um, module testing, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, fixtures are evil. So um, most of you who have been working with Ruby and Rails for a little while are probably aware of this. But if you're new to fixtures, um, be afraid. Be very afraid. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, I guess I, I won't belabor this point, but um, if you just search for, you know, factories versus fixtures or anything like that, um, the basic idea is that a fixture, again, kind of the same reason that you would use a factory in the first place, a fixture sort of wildly overdefines the data that's being tested. Um, so a fixture may have, you know, someone might go in and use that fixture for multiple different reasons. So if you have you know, a person fixture, then that person suddenly gets used for every possible use of a person, but now somebody else comes up with a new use for it, and or, you know, you have a male, you know, a person is male, suddenly somebody uses that in a situation where, you know, you need them to be female, so they just change it to female, and then all these other tests break, and you end up in a situation where you're, like, just operating at way too high a level. Um, so, in general, prefer fact, well, always use factories or fixtures. How about that? Um, <clears throat> don't write complex rake tasks. They're impossible to test. So um, this is another one that drives me nuts is 
seeing a reg task that's like 100 or 200 lines long because you know there's absolutely no test around it. Um, so instead, in general, create some sort of like facilitator object um, and then just have your rake task delegate to that facilitator. So instead of having all of the lines that are necessary to make Alan Rickman remember the turtle joke, um, instead pull that out into a class and then write some tests around it. <coughs> So I, I softened my language here after some conversation with Joel. Um, be wary of Rails callback hooks. Um, so, or I originally had avoid Rails callback hooks. This one I think is a particularly controversial thing that different people might have different experiences. Um, <clears throat> but the reason that this one, so I guess the bad is, you know, basically we end up seeing in any sufficiently advanced or su sufficiently mature Rails application is a set of like. 20 before create and before save callbacks. Um, and now, so when I just want to create a new baby object, I now have to like navigate this entirely overwrought you know, set of callbacks, 99% of which are probably not intrinsic to the construction of that object. Um, so the reason I softened it to be wary, I think there are definitely good use cases for this. Um, I think having callbacks that are uh, working, you know, that are sort of intrinsic to the construction of that object or the object just doesn't function without having some sort of setup done on it is a really good thing. But a lot of times you see people just sort of pollute the before create, before save, before validate with things that aren't necessarily intrinsic to the creation of that object. But it's just like, eh, it needs to happen at some point. Um, so the reason that this one really bugs me is that if I'm just doing baby.new, or you know, baby.create. Now I have to worry about stubbing out these methods if I don't care about them. Um, one of the egregious examples is actually in our current code base. We have a before, a before save filter that actually does a, an HTML page scrape of an Amazon page, which takes like two seconds to run. Um, so basically, just in a test, if I create a new one of these objects, I now have to, you know, hope that all of the parameters are constructed correctly in test such that it actually goes out and hits Amazon and comes back two seconds later. Um, and it's just a disaster. So um, there are stubs all over the code until I have time to go back and refactor that out and basically say, um, don't do that. So, so I didn't to Sounds like some for VCR or ephemeral response. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, and I've used things like that as well, but uh, I think my argument here would be that updating the data that we're updating is not really intrinsic. Like, it doesn't have to happen every time I save that object. Um, it really only has to happen, like, once a day, or there should be some explicit mechanism that goes out and updates that data that it's updating every time. I, like, if I just, you know, change the string by one character, right, it goes out and fetches all of new data from Amazon. Like, it doesn't feel like it's really correlated with the save operation. It's just sort of ended up entangled. Um, so yeah, I mean, in cases where you do have to hit a third-party web service, um, you know, I do use some, I use ephemeral response some of the time. Um, I tried VCR, but it I think was a little bit clumsier than what I was looking for at the time. Um, sorry, you were. I was just going to ask. Um, going back to the like onboarding people. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you start creating a bunch of class level methods that are uh, not replacements, but at least helpers on active record, like, to me, if I have like 40 of those or something, it's a really complicated class, maybe I should break that part anyway. But, you know, it sounds like you have a, a pretty complicated class you're talking about. Um, so, yeah, I, I um, guess I was probably exaggerating by saying. 20 or something. Um, like in general, I would say, to your point, like I've, I've never had more than like two or three of these more specialized, okay. like do this and this methods on a class. Um, and if I do have more, then I, then it somehow I usually ends up refactored into a different class. But, um, so I'm probably giving the fire and brimstone version of this slide. Um, whereas perhaps Joel's more measured response of like, or, or you know, I think Joel sort of guided me toward more toward a more measure of language of, you know, don't make it a call. Like, I guess sometimes callback hook becomes like, where do I put this? Oh, Rails has callback hooks. I might as well put it there. Um, 
Whereas for me, it's like, where should I put this? Not a callback hook, not a callback hook. Okay, maybe a callback hook. Um, Do you feel like observers could be a, a viable option for that too? And, and if they are, that they could be any more testable than a callback? Um, that's a good question. Um, I guess I probably haven't used observers enough that, and I guess I actually probably don't run into the situation quite enough that um, that it's probably worth the amount of like vitriol that I spit its way. But um, <clears throat> I I think observers are probably. I guess I'm non-committal on it at the moment. Um, they seem like a slight step up if they're doing something that's, again, like maybe not intrinsically related to that class. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I guess I'm a little more situational on observers. So. All right, uh, keep your test suite fast. So. This one again is kind of obvious, but one of the points of writing tests is so that you get feedback more quickly than in a traditional like six month, you know, do six months of development and get two months of QA feedback and then do three months of development. One of the reasons that you're writing tests as a developer is so that you can get nearly instantaneous feedback about all the changes you're making. Um, <clears throat> so obviously if your test suite runs in like seven seconds it's probably not worth you you know spending a week making it run in three seconds but if, it, if your test suite takes 15 minutes to run or an hour to run or something um, it's probably worth putting the time into um, getting it down so that by the time you've actually run your tests and you know you can do some regression without having to completely shift your focus and then come back to the original thing you're working on um, so how do you keep them fast? Profile. So our spec, for example, has a dash dash profile flag that will tell you the slowest 10 tests ordered by slowness. Um, I don't remember if mini test has something like that. Does anybody know? Because that's one of the reasons, that's one thing I do like about our spec, is the profiling. Um, <clears throat> so distribute your tests. That one's a little, I think, more advanced option. That's probably not where you should start. but. Um, there are several gems out there, uh, none of which I have used effectively. Spork is the simplest one that will distribute <coughs> across multiple cores on your local machine. Um, but there's spec tests and spec sure, or sorry, test sure and spec sure and test uh, Hydra is another one. There's a bunch of libraries out there for distributing them. Um, if you're in a situation where you can just sort of, you know, if you're trying to shoehorn seven different projects onto a single CI server, and that CI server is just totally overwhelmed, you may consider upgrading your hardware as well. So, um, so a couple little tricks that I threw in here. Um, so <clears throat> one, thing, one thing that I find that, or one little trick that I picked up over time is when testing modules, instead of instantiating a class that includes that module, by def like if I have a person class or, and you know, here, the person might include Tiger Blood if it's Charlie Sheen. So if I have a Charlie Sheen class that includes Tiger Blood, um, <clears throat> then instead of testing the Charlie Sheen object, there's this little trick that I picked up to um, basically create a new class that mixes in that module and then instantiate a new instance of that class. Like you're sort of creating the anonymous class and then instantiating it. So now this is one of the places where I use a setup block just because, you know, testing that trick over and over and over um, doesn't really seem like it really adds a lot of value to the test. Um, so now I'm only testing that module. There's no chance that the Charlie Sheen class has also defined, you know, hashtag or DNA quality or something. So there's no potential that I'm mixing tests or that I have side effects or anything. Um, <clears throat> extend your test suite. So I was using a search true all over the place. Um, another one that I threw in there just for kicks is um, at some point I wrote some method, which I should probably test, um, called when constant that allows me to overwrite a constant for a particular um, set of code. So the big reason I use something like, and there's probably like a three line version of that that somebody could come up with. 
Um, but the big reason I use something like that is if I have, you know, methods that are like horrendously destructive and should only run in non-production mode, you know, I might have a like, you know, a guard condition that says if you're in production, then raise an error. Um, so I needed some way to sort of, you know, check that I'm in production. So write methods to help you write cleaner tests or to help you test other conditions that you may not otherwise, not otherwise be able to test. Um, <clears throat> So only three higher level ideas out of all that. Um, so write a test for every sufficiently complex bug. So if you're, you know, if you have, get a bug that says there's an extra space in this string, like maybe it's not the end of the world unless that's a configuration string for your database, at which point maybe you should test it, I don't know. Um, test the most important things first. So, you know, a lot of people sort of go for code coverage numbers and if you have 80% code coverage but all of the code that you're testing is like you know non-critical code and you haven't actually tested anything important then you don't really have 80% coverage um, and tests are not a replacement for good design so just because you have a test for something doesn't mean that you can totally punt on thinking about the engineering problems and coming up with a good solution so I would add a 2B Make sure that you can take money, no matter what website you're making. Make sure that it passes, like you can take money from people. Oh. <laughs> that's the most important test, right? Once you can do that, you don't even care about the rest. <laughs> <laughs> you just need people to sign up. You mentioned the uh, defining, like, say, shared methods rather than using setup. Mm -hmm. um, how? I mean, I know there's some gray area, and it just a lot of times it depends, but how often do you find yourself doing that? I mean, do you, is that kind of a go-to thing anytime you sort of run into that, or would you more, would you, would you be more likely to just, you know, write more factory stuff in there and, and not be really dry with it, or would you automatically probably go to the method? Um, I, would, I would say I generally find myself I don't usually go to a setup method that often, or like to even an inline setup method mm -hmm. that often. Um, but like if I find myself, you know, constructing the same set, like if I have, you know, a, some object that takes a more complex set of parameters, like, you know, uh, <coughs> if I have a method called search that takes a query, which also contains a another object or something, you know, if I have two or three objects that I have to construct to pass into another method. Um, that's you. That's the case where I most often find myself pulling out into an inline setup method of some sort, mm -hmm. like to say, you know, valid search parameters or invalid search parameters or something, um, instead of constructing those four lines every time. But it, again, it depends on what I'm testing. If I'm actually testing the construction of those, then I'm probably not going to use that setup method. But if I've already tested the construction of the more complex parameter, and now I just want to assume that I can move on with my life, then that's kind of the point at which I would step back to that. Do you usually keep those uh, inline things to, to be only within that specific file, or do you, you do some sharing across the, the test suite? Um, I guess I haven't run into a lot of cases where I've needed to share across the test suite. Um, so if I do come across it, you should I, I will make sure to update you on my answer. Um, but at the moment, it pretty much lives within the relevant file. Um, and if it did live somewhere else, I would probably preface it with the name of some module where it lived. Like, I would probably include it in a module instead of just requiring a file that had that or including the module and then referencing it anonymously, um, just so that it's immediately obvious where the location of that code is. Thanks. Good. Good. Feel free to yell at me about this afterwards if you totally disagree and think I'm, you know, corrupting the youth or something. <laughs> Thank you.